Uh, good morning, everybody. It's 10.30, so we'll make a start. Welcome to the Health and Wellbeing Board meeting on the 23rd of July. Uh, Darren, can I have any apologies for absence? <laughs> yeah, sorry, <laughs> Councillor. Sorry, Councillor Holden. Uh, apologies for absence are from um, Ca Councillor Lydiard, Councillor Johnson, Christina Jackson, Kim James, uh, Andy Millard and Andrew Pike. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, members will notice we've got a number of guests online, obviously in accordance with the new rules, all meetings of uh, council, all voting meetings have to be held in person. The majority of people joining us online are joining us online because they are presenters. They are not voting members of the board. Um, Mr McKeever um, will become a formal member of the board at this meeting. Uh, therefore, I understand it's permissible for him to join online this time. Uh, and then we look forward to welcoming him uh, next time. I'm sure there'll be catering arrangements when we have the exalted CEO of our ICS join us. Um, because it's the first meeting of the municipal year, let's do a couple of quick introductions. If we start with people in the chamber, we start with my left. Good morning, colleagues. Ian Wakehurst, uh, Corporate Director of Adam Hill. Councillor Deborah Hewley, portfolio, portfolio, say, portfolio holder for Adult Social Services, Communities, Arts and Culture. Preeti Sood, Head of Strategy for Mid and South Essex Hospitals, here on behalf of Andrew Pike. Um, Sheila Murphy, Corporate Director for Children's Services in Thurrock. Uh, Julie Rogers, Director for Public Realm, but in uh, capacity as Chair of Thurrock Community Safety Partnership. Jo Broadbent, Director of Public Health for Thurrock. Carmel Michaels, the Assistant Director for NELFT and Thurrock Council. Erin Kennedy, Thurrock Council, Support Officer for the meeting. Uh, Darren Christensen, uh, I support the meeting. Mac, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, thank you, Chair. Anthony McKeever, MAC, the Executive Lead for uh, the Integrated Care System across Mid and South Essex and the AO for its five CCGs. Thank you, Chair. Catherine? Good morning, I'm Catherine Wilson. I'm the Strategic Lead for Commissioning Across Children and Adult Services for Thurrock Council. Um, I think that's Alex in, the, in my top left. I can't quite it, see. It is, thank you, Chair. Alex Green, Chief Operating Officer for EPUT. Uh, Michelle? Good morning, colleagues. Michelle Lucas, Assistant Director, Education Skills, Thurrock Council. Uh, Catherine? Catherine, I think you're muted. Sorry, I thought I'd just done it. Maybe not. Anyway, hello, I'm Catherine Wilson. I'm the strategic lead um, for commissioning across children and adult services for Thurrock Council. Thank you. And finally, I think we've got Karen, everyone I can see. Hi, um, morning, everybody. I'm Karen Grinney. I'm one of the managers um, in probation um, and I manage the Thurrock team. Thank you very much and welcome, everybody. Uh, to approve the minutes of the board meeting held on the 21st of January. Does anyone have any comments on the accuracy of the minutes? No? Okay, I will sign those later. Urgent items. I've not agreed to the consideration of any urgent items. Declaration of interests. Would anyone like to declare that they are interesting? Uh, I will declare that I will be from August doing some uh, policy consultancy work for the East of England Ambulance Service. Uh, item five, integrated care system update. This is not going to be a victory lap, but there will be a degree of 
um, joy with this item. Ian, why don't you lead off? Uh, so I, I think uh, most colleagues are probably aware by now we had the decision from the Secretary of State on the boundaries of the um, ICS. Um, I'm pleased to report that um, his decision was that the boundaries uh, will stay at Mid and South Essex level. Um, as colleagues are aware, that was the um, firm view and wish of the local authority. Um, I'm personally very relieved. Um, I think uh, a, a change in boundaries would have uh, caused a whole range of unnecessary disruption and um, now the boundary issue is, is finally settled. We can move forward in terms of creating our shared vision uh, uh, and capitalise on the existing relationships and all of the goodwill between partners to build something that really, really works for our residents. So um, I don't know Mark or whether Mac wanted to, to add anything to that. Mark Tebbs. Um, thank you, Chair. So um, the bill has now had its second reading. Uh, we've now got the design uh, framework for the new integrated care system. And uh, we are expecting a lot more guidance to come through around the kind of details of what, what the kind of functions are at the kind of different levels. Um, indeed, we've got a workshop this afternoon just to kind of start that local collective thinking around what the kind of what the structure of the integrated care system looks like uh, and the kind of roles and responsibilities and delegations within that. Um, so we're expecting a lot more guidance to kind of flesh out the detail around what all of that means and where the responsibilities will sit. Um, but we are starting now the kind of conversations to bring together our kind of collective thinking around shaping what that looks like. And obviously the clarification on uh, boundaries is enormously helpful to be able to do that. So, yeah. Thank you, Mark. Does anyone else wish to comment? I think I'll just um, take a moment to uh, thank our colleagues in the ICS. Over the last um, period, we've been very, very well served by an outstanding independent chairman in Professor Mike Thorne, who has ensured that all partners get a firmly uh, fair shake of the sauce bottle, which we are all incredibly grateful. We've been served by a expert chief executive in Anthony McKeever, who has um, had one of the most galling tasks of literally creating something from virtually nothing. Um, and that has gone very, very well indeed. The decision on boundaries is very welcome. I'm grateful for hospital colleagues sticking their head above the parapet. I'm grateful for the work of our ICS colleagues from our MP, uh, Jackie Dole Price um, and Stephen Metcalf. I would just say that I did tot up on Monday over the last 12 months, how many meetings I've had to attend to talk about ICS reform rather than talking about healthcare for our constituents. Over 12 months of being chairman of the board or being the portfolio holder for social services, it came to 113 meetings. And I think I attended far fewer than my uh, director at the time did, uh, our new director did, or indeed Mac did. So the fact that we can now move past constant conversations about boundaries and structures and actually focus on the mental health issues that our people face to focus on children's services within the ICS. These things are extraordinarily welcome. So it's time to move on. It's time to put this um, perpetual fight in the past and to get on with our three priorities uh, for our ICS. Uh, so we will move swiftly on to children's and young people's mental health and wellbeing services in Thurrock. And that is for Michelle Lucas uh, and Catherine Wilson. So, shall I invite Catherine to lead off? Yes, thank you. Sir. <clears throat> um, um, I bring a report today with my colleague Michelle, and also Helen Farmer is here from the CCG. So, um, and we will um, talk through <clears throat> the progress um, regarding the procurement and also the emerging um, Thurrock model of delivery. So, um, as you are aware, we are firmly placing that delivery model within our Brighter Future strategy, supporting our very ambitious plans for a new integrated model of support for children and young people with emotional well-being challenges. Um, the procurement for the new service across the Greater Essex footprint began on the 4th of May this year, 
and the new contract will be in place from the 1st of February 2022. Um, and as you know, this is a collaboration between the seven CCGs and three local authorities across Greater Essex. And this collaborative forum and approach has been in place for this contract since 2015. And prior to that, things were far more fragmented and there's been very significant and positive progress in having that collaborative approach. The delivery of mental health services for children and young people, um, as everyone will know, is a priority. Firstly, within the NHS Five Year Forward View for Mental Health Services published in 2016. And secondly, reiterated again within the long NHS Long Term Plan of 2019. And that commitment is very, very strong across um, all partners. Um, and we also have to be very mindful within the model as we go forward in the new service that we need to recognise the impact of COVID-19 on our children and young people. The specification for the new service does allow for local determinants and we had a lot of negotiation and um, discussion around that to ensure that we could have um, a local approach within that collaborative commissioning forum and they were very supportive of that um, and we, we wanted to be really clear that we include some very significant core elements um, within our own local service response. So a strong integration of workers from the CAMS um, service into our Brighter Futures work and local governance through our Brighter Futures board, which is inclusive of our local schools to ensure that our thorough assets are integrate, integral and at the centre of the, the CAMS decision making process. Um, and alongside this, of course, um, we recognise the significant benefits of being part of a wider contract. I mean, the, the value of this contract is upwards of £21 million, offering specialist inputs and services and access for our young people and children here in Thurrock to those services. So it's really important that we see the benefits of both ways of working. Um, <clears throat> the new emerging model that we're looking at, and Michelle will, will describe shortly, is underpinned by, of course, seven clear principles which we've outlined in the report that the service is holistic, responsive, integrated, preventative and resilient, that it's evidence based and also that it has a robust single point of access, bringing together our local responses. The um, Collaborative Commissioning Forum and the executive group that, uh, that manages that is very obviously supportive of those principles and they are embedded within the specification. Um, and much research has been undertaken around how um, high quality services for young people can be developed. And it's very important that in developing those services, we involve children, young people and families and carers. We have significant collaboration between organisations, very innovative ways of working and positive and good access together with education and training of staff. All of that is underpinned within the specification. Um, so the, the practicalities of this contract are that the, the procurement is underway, the evaluation, et cetera, and the award will be made later this year. Um, and that will be, um, the new contract will be in place, as I say, from the 1st of February. Um, it's a seven year contract with a three year option to extend, covering all the specialist service, um, services that are required and out of hours responses, etc. So it's a very comprehensive um, specification which we have access fully to. Um, so now I'm going to pass over to Michelle, who's going to talk about our, the next steps for our emerging um, model here in Thurrock. Uh, thank you, Catherine, and good morning, colleagues. I think what I want to do is start by recognising, um, you know, the, the really, really positive partnership working with our colleagues from the CCG, Helen's on the call um, with public health uh, in Theresa. Theresa couldn't join us today and clearly our commissioning team um, to get us to where we are. I think it's a really exciting opportunity for us. We've got a number of things at local system level. So we've got our school wellbeing service, which has been up and running now for, for nearly two years, as well as the very excited mental health teams uh, working within our schools. So what we believe is that we're able to pull all that together into um, a local network, we're currently calling it, so that when referrals do go into the, the main single point of access, which will remain, is well embedded now and is working well, 
if one of our young people or a child does not meet threshold, there is somewhere where that child can be uh, uh, referred back to, to look at what we can do at a local system level. Thurrock has got a, a range of um, really, really positive um, programmes. We've got voluntary sector engagement. As I said, we've got our school wellbeing service. We've also got our mental health uh, sort of teams in schools. I think the key thing for me about this is, has been about the consultation we've done about looking at this. We've done some clear work around our Brighter Futures consultation. We've spoken to our schools. We've tried to listen um, to what our partners, our families are saying to us. Some of the things for us around the next steps is clearly strengthening that network as we move forward on the uh, evolving uh, model. Some, one of the things we've identified clearly is what support we can put in for parents. So we're looking at what um, is possible with some of the services we've got to support parents around this. I think what I do need to say um, to the board is that clearly we run some risk here. It's within the report. Um, we've got funding for a set period for our school wellbeing service. Uh, we've managed to look at, um, you know, extending that slightly with some uh, reconfiguration um, around the service. But that does remain a risk for us. And I think we need to we need to flag that now. We are looking at ways in which we can mitigate that risk. But I think what we're looking to do is to continue to evolve what we're trying to do at a local system level that will enable us to work closely with whoever the new provider uh, may be. Clearly, that's out for procurement at the moment. I think the other thing I do think is worth talking about is that actually, uh, you know, we've had really positive conversations with the Collaborative Commissioning um, Forum. You know, they're really interested in what we're like, what we're looking to do in Thurrock. And I think, you know, we want to share that. And as is true to form for Thurrock, of course, we will be undertaking evaluation um, around this work. And again, I thank our colleagues in public health you know, who are supporting us with this around thinking around, uh, you know, uh, how we evaluate the service. How can we show the impact? You know, what difference does it make, colleagues? That's going to be um, the key question. Um, I know Helen's on the call and she's worked really hard with us on this. So if I may be indulged just for a minute, Chair. Helen, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add, because as I said, you've worked really closely with us on this. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Chair. Um, just, to, just to add to that message of that collaboration and partnership working, I think the opportunities that the ICS gives us is that it's very clear in, in the importance of place. It's very clear in the importance and where service redesign and collaboration and co-production needs to sit, and that's at place with our partners. Um, and, and we've gone a long way on that journey with this particular piece of work, um, with that sort of element of the, of the children's Brighter Future strategy. So um, I think there's work to do, but we've made great steps forward. I think we're in a current situation. If I'm, you know, I'm sure all colleagues on the call will be very aware the impact of COVID and the pandemic on our children we're seeing loud and clear coming through. Um, at all levels and we've got all system partners wanting to come together to really address that uh, at a, and when I say system in this context I mean the system within Thurrock to work together to make sure we have a strong offer from prevention right through to our children presenting with the highest needs in crisis and 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 all at all of those levels we've got really strong partnership working that we just need to build on and use the opportunity of the new procurement and the new um, specification to support that delivery. Um, so yeah, I think um, lots of work to do, uh, lots of challenges to address, but are in the right place um, and the right steps going forwards. Thank you very much, uh, Michelle, Helen and Catherine. I can see Mac indicating and then Alex. Thank you, Chair. Um, it, this is a, an excellent piece of work and um, I, I do think it's coming together well, but um, the, the paperwork and the contracting of these services is only one dimension of it, isn't it? Um, and I think it's the collaborative working that we've seen over the last year that has been uh, so powerful and that I'd not only like to commend and support, but to see us extend. Um, Right now, the facilities for some of the most challenged young people um, that EPUT operates for us regionally are, are somewhat constrained because of some regulatory factors beyond the, the control of the trust. 
And what it's seen is um, communities and local services having to um, absorb uh, greater pressures and greater numbers of children that would have previously been escalated. I know that Alex uh, Green is with us and um, uh, Alex has explained to me before that uh, actually the client group that is in those facilities that are called tier four facilities are a very challenging group and um, the resources and commissioning that specialist commissioners um, have put in place at, at that higher level um, are, are not necessarily um, exactly what we would want to preserve for the future. We, we're going to have to look at all of these things again. And when, when we talk about systems and place and all the rest of it, it can be very conceptualized sometimes. sometimes. In this instance, the more that can be done at local level, the more we should direct resource and uh, focus in future. So the contract is very welcome to see that coming in place. But I think that um, the work that's done within Thurrock for Thurrock children is going to be the thing that I will want to throw uh, our weight behind most. Um, and I'm very grateful for all the work that people have done, Chair. Thank you, Mac. Alex? Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, Mac. Um, I'm probably not going to say anything <clears throat> particularly different, except that um, absolutely support the work. It's fantastic to, to hear about. I've been involved in three system conversations in MSC this week alone about children and young people. And I think that demonstrates the commitment that we have collectively to try and resolve some of the issues that we have. Highly emotive, these are our children and it needs to be better for them. Um, the impact of COVID is absolutely there to see, but actually that demand particularly in the tier four sphere, was growing before COVID. It's just exacerbated it beyond anything that we've ever seen in those services. Um, we've got to start talking more about families in the same space. We've got to start talking more about physical and mental health and the interdependencies in the same space. But I think we have a burning platform for change and I'm really pleased to be part of those conversations. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Michelle, if I could just push you um, further on some of the details. One of the things that we built into the tender to deal with the unacceptable waiting times and unresponsiveness of the system uh, of Humes in the past was that this new tender arrangement would second workers directly into us. So whether that sit with Inspire or sit with Better Futures, workers would be seconded into a thorough model rather than a centralised model that simply deploys locally. Can you talk to how that's going and if we're actually closing in on a final arrangement? I mean, clearly um, there's going to be, a, well, there will be a, we don't know who the new provider will be. That's part of the answer to that question, Chair. I think the issue for us is when we took this to the collaborative commissioning um, sort of forum, in principle, they agreed with what we were saying, which was we want that close working relationship. We want to ensure that we've got, you know, all parts of the services working um, sort of collegiately um, together to make sure that we can uh, provide the services that we want to do for our children and young people. So I think there was a general um, sort of view that said that was within the realms of the possible. But clearly, Chair, given that we haven't yet got the new provider, um, you know, in situ, um, that's difficult because that will need some of that working through the system. So in principle, there was, um, you know, a, a clear understanding that that's what Thurrock was saying would help us move this forward. And we're looking at ways and we'll continue to ensure that that is remains one of the key focuses, as there are many others, of course, Chair. There are, you know, one of the things that people were clear about was the um, having the officers at a local level, but there were other things that, you know, we wanted to make sure was working to um, provide the right services at the right time. Thanks, Michelle. I, I appreciate we haven't got a provider in place, so we don't have exact details and rollout yet, but clearly, in terms of the commissioning partnership, which is the set area, one would assume that our colleagues would not be attempting to award a tender to an organisation 
that had either no intention or no capacity of seconding staff into us. So I, I know so we don't have the, the arrangement in place yet, but surely the conversations are taking place at the tender level that a eligible bidder should not be someone who does not intend to second workers into us. Otherwise, we'll just end up with the same human system that we had before. Yeah, so those comments, clearly that was part of the specification, as, as you're aware. We did a lot of work, didn't we, around working with partners around the specification. So, you know, those conversations, of course, will take place. And, you know, once we've got the new provider uh, in place, we'll look at the best way in which we can support um, children and young people going forward. Uh, Mac? Just to support your position, uh, Chair, I'm, I've not been involved in the process my, myself, but at some point somebody would probably uh, send a piece of paper in my direction to sign. And whoever the provider is, I would um, uh, want to uh, speak to them about their tender places um, and how we could press, press them in those tender places uh, to agree your point on uh, secondments before we signed any contract. That would certainly be my approach uh, when the contracting dance is over, Chair. I, I think your suggestion is entirely sensible and it fits, fits completely with my remarks about the more locally we can do things, the better off we'll be in this sphere. So in my mind, it would be an impediment to a credible uh, bid. Um, thank you, Chair. That, thank you, Mac. That, that's extraordinarily helpful. I think the one thing I would just reflect on is the fact that, as a part of this new tender, one of the clear outcomes that we've designated is all children and young people who meet the referral criteria having their first appointment within 31 days. Now, that is not overly different from what is currently built into the UMS contract tender, and that is a target that we know is very, very rarely actually achieved. So, as a part of this process, we have to be quite clear that before the... We have a fire alarm, so bear with us. We are not on fire, it was a drill. Um, anyway, what was I? Yeah, so the, the, the new tender, the things that... Oh, sorry, Jenny. Sorry about that, colleagues. Um, so just, just to continue with what I was saying, that you know, the 31-day period of having their first appointment for a mental health referral that meets the criteria, you know, there, there are standards in the UMS contract that we simply know didn't work. Our schools told us it didn't work. Our health colleagues told us it didn't work. So it, it's absolutely imperative. We're not just waiting to the point at which a tender is awarded and then having that argument about secondment, someone should not be managed, someone should not be capable of winning the tender unless if they can firmly state secondment, yes, um, sticking within targets, yes. And as a part of that, they need to be able to demonstrate when they've done that in the past. Because we, 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 we've been through this dance before. CAMs didn't work. We replaced uh, CAMs and we had UMs and UMs didn't work properly. We can't keep on having a, a groundhog day so I, I don't want to sound like I'm a dog with a bone with the tender, but waiting for a partner to get into place and then hoping we can win that battle with them when they've already legally won a, a contract is too late by then. I, I, I want to guarantee that the thorough rollout will happen as intended before they actually win. Uh, Mac, you want to come back in? Just to clarify, Chair, so that I don't withhold my signature for the wrong reason, um, I'm absolutely with you on the point about secondments. I get that. And as I've said, um, it would be an, an impediment to a credible tender from, from my standpoint. Um, your, your point about targets, targets are always that, that bit trickier for me, and I'm not familiar with the detail of it. May I just clarify, are, are you saying that we need um, a better target than the 31 days presently proposed? 
or that we must be able to absolutely guarantee complete conformance and compliance with the target. Because that second one, um, although our main purpose and our, our uh, key goal is a trickier one to be black and white about, just to, to clarify whether it's the conformance or the scope of the target that you were concerned about. I, I think being quite frank, I would like the mental health service to be as fast as humanly possible. I'm informed by clever people that uh, 31 days is a reasonable expectation in terms of an initial assessment. So whilst I would like to make it faster, I'm, I'm informed that that's a reliable time period. I think I'm just more focused on the fact that the, the contract has to do, do what it says on the tin. And I just don't think that was our experience with Humes and it wasn't our experience with CAMS. So adherence to a contract, I don't think uh, should just be taken as a ambition. I think it should be taken as what it is, which is a contractual obligation. Right, does anyone have any other comments on this item? Okie doke then. Um, I don't think we've got any formal recommendations other than to note, have we? Uh, Health and Wellbeing Board to be aware of the progress. Uh, being made. I think we're sufficiently aware of the progress. So thank you very much for your report and we will move on to item seven which is the health and wellbeing strategy refresh and that is for Joe Broadbent to present. Thank you. I'm just going to attempt to share my screen. Okay. So, thank you, Chair. Um, I'd I'm going to talk through the um, proposal for the refresh of the Thoric Health and Wellbeing Strategy. Um, I am going to cover uh, proposed content um, and how we are proposing the vision and how the content will relate to that vision, and then a little bit about the process of developing the strategy. So that's, uh, that's essentially what I'm going to cover. So as, as um, the members of the board will know, um, the Health and Wellbeing Strategy is one of the two highest level strategic documents that the local authority and system partners have, the other being the local plan, and as the chair has, uh, um, as I think noted, um, it's one of the statutory documents that we have to have in place. It's also one of the documents that the ICS design framework that was referred to earlier um, mentioned that the ICS must have regard to when planning strategy. So it's an important local strategy and it's an important lever that we have to improve the health and well-being of the, of the communities in Thurrock. Um, the work we've done so far and with system partners um, has identified that the, the strategy, it, although it needs to be high level and strategic, we want it to be ambitious and we want it to set out genuinely new, uh, new, new innov innovative plans rather than just rely on work that's already being done. So we need to look to the future and be innovative. Um, the theme that we are working towards, and that I'd like the board to consider today, please, is around levelling the playing field. And I'll say a little bit more about what that means and how we can approach that in a moment. But um, underpinning that are the, the persisting intergenerational health inequalities that we see in Thurrock and the, the areas that are not level across the broad range of um, public services and community life that we have within the borough. Um, so this is the suggested structure. I won't go through that in any detail, but we will um, look back to the previous strategy. We are um, updating the outcomes framework from the previous strategy at the moment, so we will look at what was achieved through that strategy. We will look at how the, uh, the strategy fits strategically within Thurrock, but also within in the national direction of travel. Um, we will talk to the community and draw on engagement that's already been done with the community about community views, about health and well-being. And then we'll set out some high-level but ambitious um, goals for a number of domains of health and well-being and then um, 
have an outcomes framework that will measure progress against um, the goals that we determine. So in terms of strategic fit, um, as, as I've said, the health and wellbeing strategy needs to take a whole system approach. It's not just a council strategy, it's a whole system strategy uh, and needs to be cognizant of the Mid and South Essex ICS as well as the, um, the work going on within Thurrock itself. In terms of strategic fit with the council's vision, we are proposing that we have six domains of work uh, and we've aligned these to at least one uh, of the three, the council's three visions around people, place and prosperity, So, sort of as you can see on the slide. So we are proposing that the first domain um, is, is about quality care centred around the person, so holistic care, integrated care across health and care services that, that meet people's needs holistically. The second domain is, uh, propose, is uh, promoting staying healthier for longer. So that's about identifying, treating and managing um, ill health where it exists and also preventing both physical and mental ill health um, in the first place. The third domain that we're proposing is around building strong and cohesive communities. So this will draw very much on the work around the collaborative communities framework and is linking into Stronger Together Thurrock, and that's where a lot of that work to develop this domain will be done. The fourth proposed domain is around opportunity for all, and that's, that's a life course opportunity from, from before birth through to school readiness, employment opportunities, encompassing the growth, uh, the economic growth agenda in Thurrock, which as we know, we have a lot of opportunity over the coming years, um, and we want to make sure that that translates into improved health and wellbeing. The fifth domain um, we're proposing is around housing in the environment, so people's living environment as well as green spaces uh, and people's use of green spaces. And then the sixth domain um, is around community safety and aligns very much with the work of the Community Safety Partnership across a number of fronts, so everything from safeguarding vulnerable people um, from fraud, cuckooing, etc., through to um, the work we've been doing around sexual violence and abuse, and also also youth violence and vulnerability. So, so that's a sort of a, a quick whistle stop tour of the, the breadth that we see the domains uh, that we're proposing covering. Uh, and those domains will all feed into the proposed uh, vision of levelling the playing field. Uh, and without going into too much detail on individual domains, just looking at that. Um, that concept at a high level for a moment. Thurrock experiences inequalities uh, as a whole, both when compared to England, but also within the borough itself. Um, so if we look at life expectancy as a high level measure of this inequality or where, um, where opportunities aren't level across the community, a life expectancy in Thurrock has fallen below the England average in the past 10 years. Um, for women, it's significantly lower than the England average. And if we consider healthy life expectancy, which is how long a person can, can expect to live in good health, um, the graph on the left just shows, the bottom line shows that for, for Thurrock, we've fallen significantly below the England average in recent years. If we consider um, where things are not level within the borough, uh, and life expectancy within Thurrock. We know we have a 10-year life expectancy gap between the most and least affluent communities within Thurrock itself. And if we consider that healthy life expectancy concept again, we know that women in the most affluent areas of Thurrock experience eight years more healthy life than those in the most deprived. And women in those most deprived areas can expect to experience 22 years of poor health, 22 years of their shorter life experience. Uh, life expectancy. So, so there's a considerable inequity there. But, but what can we do about it and how can the health and wellbeing strategy address this uh, across those domains that I've outlined? Well, there's been a lot of research into what determines health and wellbeing status for individuals and communities. And, and the little um, illustration I've got here is from some work that the King's Fund have done drawing on this breadth of research. And they've identified that health and wellbeing status is, is influenced by a range of factors. So it's influenced by things like our genetics, our age, our gender, 
uh, but it's also um, influenced by extrinsic factors. So our health behaviours uh, and lifestyles um, influences health status. The places and communities we live in, so that's the environment, but also the resilience we have within the communities. Um, our access to health and care services also um, influences health status, although actually this is one of the smaller influences the research generally tends to agree. Uh, and, and then the big one is the wider determinants of health. And I've just listed in the bullet points in the bottom at the left some of the wider determinants that the King's Fund identify as being crucial for um, maximising health and wellbeing in communities. So income and access to employment, high quality housing, um, high quality education and being ready to start education in the early years. Um, spatial planning, access to green spaces, uh, transport and active travel, uh, and, and the environment that we live in. And then on the right, I've just put some, some examples of, of how the big strategic agendas that we have in Thurrock are already um, working in this space. Uh, and we need to draw on the, these big strategic agendas, such as the Freeport, and really um, make sure that the, the, the benefits that the community gets are shared across the community. And it's inclusive growth, for example, that we secure from this, from these um, initiatives. So I talked about the, the six domains that we're proposing. This is just a little bit about how we're approaching developing the work in those domains uh, and just some of the council and partner leads um, that have been involved already are listed on this slide. Um, these domains also link into a wide number of strategies and in particular I'd highlight the Brighter Futures Children strategy um, that we're going to hear about and also the adults place-based strategy that is in development for Thurrock at the moment. We're also linking with collaborative communities, Stronger Together as I mentioned and then a range of strategies such as the housing strategy, the act transport and active travel strategy etc. Um, what we, there's a lot of small words on this, so don't worry about the small words because these will change, but this is just to illustrate what we see um, ultimately the high level summary of the strategy looking like. Each of the proposed domains will have three to four key high level objectives that sit beneath, um, beneath that domain. Um, and the, the different colours blue, just to illustrate that those are underpinned in terms of delivery by a range of different strategies that are already in place or in development within Thurrock. So the bright blue is the adult place-based strategy that I talked about. The brighter future strategy will obviously play into this. And then the darker blue, that range of strategies that I talked about that range from sexual violence and abuse, for example, through to um, health protection. So what are we aiming for in the chapter on each of these domains? Um, so on the right there, this is just an extract from the last health and wellbeing strategy and the very high level summary uh, that we had for one of the goals. So this is the goal for healthier, uh, for longer. And you can see that actually in that strategy, the summary is very high level uh, and very accessible to the community. But sitting behind that, we will have a lot of work that we need to do over the next few months. Uh, and on the left, I've just listed the work that we're asking each of the groups that are working on each of the domains to do. So first of all, we need to identify what are the challenges in this area? What's getting in the way of us having a level playing field in Thurrock in this area uh, that influences health and well-being? Uh, and what is it that we want to achieve? What are the high-level goals that we need for this domain and that we need to work collectively towards? We want to know what will achieving this goal look like. So what will, if we achieve these objectives, you know, what will be different? What will the measures be? Why is this important? And ultimately, how will this level the playing field? How will this reduce those inequalities? And so this will all be underpinned by monitoring metrics, by identifying the strategies that sit under each domain and how those delivery mechanisms will work and identifying barriers, risks and opportunities to inform our work with partners in this area. Um, we will have an outcomes framework, as I mentioned, and this is just what the outcomes framework in the last uh, health and wellbeing strategy looked like, just to give you an idea that we will have that how the metrics will relate to each of the high level objectives. So that's a lot to do in quite a short space of time. And I just want to talk briefly now about sort of the process, a bit more about the process and how we're approaching it. 
So we have worked up a timeline that has been working from back from a document launch in January. This would mean that essentially from the sign off of the scope today, which I hope the board will be able to agree, we will have an engagement period over the summer. Uh, we would need to identify priorities for each domain by the end of September in order to be able to bring the draft strategy document to this group in October. Now, that's an awful lot of work to do to get to that point by October. So, so one of the things I would like to ask the board today is consider if we could extend that period of time uh, so that we can have a strategy document full sign off in February and I think that would give us more time for meaningful engagement with the community but we would also end up with a better product I think and we would also be able to engage with this board and with stakeholders in a much more meaningful way. In terms of the governance and monitoring the the sign off and ownership of the strategy is ultimately this board here today. Um, we have a number of other groups, though, that are giving oversight and direction. We have the Health and Wellbeing and TICP Strategy Group that reports into TICP Group that's chaired by Ian Wake that has been incredibly helpful in getting us to this point in a very short space of time in terms of this scope. Um, Councillor Haldon is also chairing a group of council ADs uh, which can provide oversight from the very, all the different directorates within the council and make sure we're going in the right direction in terms of those wider determinants. In terms of the process, I've set up um, a sort of task and finish steering group that includes the leads for each of those domains, also others such as Sarah Welton from the strategy team, uh, the health intelligence team are represented, and we will coordinate this, uh, this work day to day. We've also got an engagement group uh, that includes partners from uh, the community and voluntary sector, the Better Care Together engagement group, um, and also the comms team and the community engagement team to help us shape the engagement approach that we're going to take over the strategy. And then finally, just a little bit more about that community engagement approach. So, as I said, we, have, we are constrained by time and even with an extended timetable. We're not where we ideally would have been um, had we not had yeah, COVID over the next the past uh, 18 months. So, so this has impacted on the time we have to do a lot of work. So the engagement group is proposing um, the following uh, approach to engagement, that we draw on qualitative community input in a number of ways. So firstly, from drawing on previous engagement exercises, such as Better Care Together Thurrock, uh, Your Place, Your Voice, uh, the second way is to draw on contemporaneous views that are being collected by the CVS in their new Airtable database. So this collects um, summary input from the many interactions that the community builders and others in the CVS have on a day-to-day -day basis and collates it into one database that is searchable by theme, by keyword, etc. And I think there's a huge amount of potential in the future for us, for us working with them. Um, in this way. And then to have, well, online uh, Q&A events at the moment, we, we may look at doing face-to-face -face if, we, if we're able to do that, um, depending on how the next few months goes with COVID, I guess. Um, we also want to do a consultation on the high-level priorities and what the engagement group thought would be a quite a focused way to do this and not an open-ended way would be to take those challenges for each domain that I mentioned and the proposed priorities, a long list of proposed priorities for each domain uh, and consult on those uh, and ask people what they think is important in the domains that are important to them in two ways. So firstly, through the council engagement online HQ and secondly, through ex existing community group and stakeholder group meetings and do that in quite a focused and targeted way. And I will stop there. Thank you very much, Joe, for a very comprehensive but swift overview. Uh, comments or questions? Uh, let's have uh, Ian Wake and then Councillor Hewlin. Thank you, Chair. Um, as Joe said, this is um, an incredibly important strategy. It's the highest level. Um, strategy that we have alongside the the local plan and its reach needs it needs to drive action across the entire uh, local authority and beyond it um, through our, our system partners um, it will form there's a lot of strategy refresh going on this year so we have this one um, you, you've just heard um, or we have the brighter future strategy 
um, uh, uh, on the agenda. Um, uh, at the same time, we are refreshing the um, Thurrock Integrated Care Partnership Adult Strategy. And those, that, that kind of trio of documents, the health and wellbeing strategy and then the, the two um, detailed strategies that sit underneath it, I think form in terms of the ICS Thurrock the place. That's not to say there are a whole range of other strategies that need to sit underneath the health and wellbeing strategy. So we are refreshing the housing strategy at the moment as well. Um, so a, an incredibly exciting time. The other reason it's, it's really important is that the health and social care bill um, that's, that's going through Parliament at the moment is, is clear that the ICS must have regard to our health and wellbeing strategy locally. Um, I, I really support um, the overarching theme of levelling the playing field. I think that is incredibly timely in the context of COVID um, and um, just in the context uh, of the intergenerational health inequalities that Thurrock has suffered for far too long and are incredibly challenging and difficult to um, to overcome. It was it was quite pleasing actually that the strategy group um, came up with the same theme as, as the chair of this board completely independently. Um, so hopefully we, we are on the same page, um, certainly in terms of that. Um, it needs to be high level. Um, it needs to absolutely be ambitious. Um, and it needs to be genuinely driving and genuinely new. There's always a, a, a temptation with these strategies to try and capture everything that's already going on. But we, we need to resist that. We need to be, I think, quite ruthless in terms of what sits underneath um, the six domains and, and pick the three or four most important things. Um, but they kind of need to be genuinely new things and genuinely driving things. Um, I support the um, proposal for the timescale extension. As Joe says, uh, we need to do a huge amount of work in a, a relatively short amount of time. Um, uh, I just had one question, um, which I have posed uh, uh, earlier this week, but or maybe a comment and a question. Um, we need to make sure that we don't um, uh, develop domains in silos. So, so I guess to phrase that into a question, how, how can we ensure that we've got cross-fertilisation in terms of the domains themselves? Joe, did you want to answer questions as we go along, or did you want to sweep up several? Did you want to answer now? Well, if you want to respond to Director now. So I think there's... Um, well, I think, firstly, the oversight of this board... Um, and the, the, you know, the multidisciplinary uh, membership of this board is ultimately where we make sure that, that this is a coherent and not a siloed strategy. Um, in terms of the, the development as we go along, we, as I said, we've got the um, task and finish group, the steering group, which has got the leads from all of the different uh, domain work streams. So we will do the first check in that group. Um, to make sure that we're not that, that, that this is all sitting together that a we're not too siloed but equally we're not duplicating we think that there are a lot of cross-cutting themes that we've already identified that we will need to put into principles that will probably cross the whole the whole of the strategy I didn't really talk about that but that group will do a first cut of that we will then have the ADs group that Councillor Halden is going to chair that will do a similar sort of sense check um, but from that sort of senior leadership point of view from the council and then we will keep the uh, TICP um, group advised as well as we also progress. So I think we've got checks on that at several levels, hopefully. I think, I think Ian's comment about um, the, the steering group came up with um, a theme uh, entirely independently from uh, the one that I suggested, which is Ian's gentle way of saying that slow politicians like me aren't always essential. Uh, Councillor Hewlin and then Julie Rogers. Thank you, Chair. Um, I totally agree with Ian. Um, I do love the name Leveling Up. It, it fits perfectly. And um, we have got to focus on the three, four key priorities. So I suppose as the newbie here with no real background history to this, I, I looked at this and being a woman in this borough, the 51%, so we're slightly more than everybody else, to find out I've got 22 years potential pain coming my way and I'm going to live uh, a lot less length of time than the majority of the UK. And actually, I don't even know if I'm a good or a bad bit area of Thurrock right now, so I might be moving soon. Um, I, I didn't see that life expectancy and that whole thing around health for women 
as a key priority. I saw domestic violence mentioned on the worksheet. I didn't see that. And like, obviously, to me, that's a real high priority. So if it's not one of the three, four important priorities, I'd like to understand why not and how the priorities were set so that I fully appreciate that we've got the right priorities going forward. I'll just, I'll just clarify, because you live in the Homesteads Ward, you live in a magnificent part of the borough. I'm confident you'll get well into the triple figures uh, based on the electoral area that you live. Uh, Joe, did you want to respond to Councillor Hewley now, and then we'll go with Julie? Yeah, I can do. And yeah, no, that's an excellent question. And I think it comes back to, um, as I said, there are things that need to cut across the whole of the strategy. So health inequalities and how these play through into a measure such as life expectancy, it's really complex. So one of the things that we're doing at the moment is each of the little groups is looking at what are the particular inequalities that we know about in each of these areas. Um, so that we can get that sort of granular detail. And I think the themes of um, equity across different community groups then to need to flow through every single one of the domains. So I think it's, um, and so it's differences between genders, between ages quite often, between ethnic groups and certainly between different uh, geographical groups and different groups in terms of socioeconomic wellbeing. So we need to make sure that's threaded as a thread through all the work that we're planning. Um, one of the things I know that I emailed yourself and Councillor Haldon was about that perhaps we could enhance within the council how the council papers, uh, like we do in terms of equity, have a th um, think explicitly about health inequity uh, at, the, at the end of the papers. And I think by driving that kind of thinking through all the work that the council's doing, that will also help um, reinforce inequalities across a, a whole range of... of um, community uh, characteristics, I guess. Yeah, it might, it, it might just be me sort of misinterpreting, but when you say reinforcing the data and the quality of it, well, we're kind of knowing where we are, but it's the why, and then actually for me, it's obviously what we're going to do with the data, the other side of that, how we're going to use that and how we're going to move forward and actually improve health. If, if I could just support what Councillor Hewden is saying, I think, um, I know at the end of this meeting we wanted um, Darren circulate some draft questions that we'll be sending to the AD group uh, regarding what we constitute as an uneven playing field. I think that gets to the heart of the point that you're making about you know, why is this the case. So if, we, if we're saying that the data shows us that um, women from certain areas of the borough will live 22 years of uh, elongated poor health, it's, it's important that different directorates start to come to us with their opinion of why that is happening. And I'm sure that if you asked um, Sheila, Julie and Ian in isolation, Ian may make a point about, well, perhaps it's poor housing that is uh, causing that. Sheila may make a point to say, well, actually, you need to track these women's um, life back further back to school. And Julie may make an entirely different point about the, the general environment that they live in. I think it's only when we have... I think it's very important that, as a board, and certainly us as members, we have a very clear audit from that AD group of what we think constitutes an uneven playing field, so we can kind of ask those deeper questions. Yes, 22 years is very interesting, but why is that the case? And you know, my sense is that probably why is going to be multiple answers kind of gelled into one. So I think it's really important that we get that work and... Um, Perhaps we'll, we'll circulate a copy of the questions that we're going to pose to the AD group, to the to the wider board, Darren, and people can ping in with their own comments about the types of questions that we should be posing about an, what is or is not an uneven playing field. Yeah, if we, if we don't understand the why, we can't do the how. Yeah, yeah and I think the why has to kind of be the first step. Yeah. Um, go Julie Rogers and then Mark Tebbs. Thank you, Chair. Um, just really to put my support to this document, um, the strategy is really, really important. And I think for, for me, really refreshing to see a real focus around the, the community um, safety. And of course, I would have to say that as chair of the Community Safety Board. But more and more, we're seeing antisocial behaviour and things that are either affecting mental health or mental health affecting antisocial behaviour. 
And as a consequence of that, driving out, um, designing out um, how we um, create the <laughs> environment that it's safe and welcoming uh, and all of those things is really, really important. And then to add to that, we've seen through COVID the importance of our parks and our green spaces and our open spaces on everybody's mental health and, and health and wellbeing generally. That's not new. That, that was around in the Victorian times. The Victorians actually put parks in to enable people and families to have spaces where they could get fresh air, they could get a, a different site, um, and they could be mentally stimulated. Um, and so, again, I really do welcome this, and I know that my teams are welcoming this, and I see this as a really exciting opportunity to put right some of the things that aren't right at the moment and, and look to see how we can improve um, everybody's health and well-being. So I, I really wholeheartedly support this document. Thank you. I think that's a brilliant comment and especially rectifying current problems. And that's why I think Ian briefly touched on it. We don't just want a reiteration of all the things the council is currently doing, because if we know that there are certain inequalities, take the 22 years, for example, we don't just want every department to copy and paste existing strategies, because we know there are certain inequalities that we're at the moment not quite getting to the nub of. So your reference to you, know, you actively build parks to tackle those areas, it's those new work streams that are so exciting. The, the other point I would just make is this aligns really well with the Police and Fire Crime Commissioner's um, new strategy that, again, I, I attended a meeting with the leader of the council yesterday to look at what the new priorities are going to be. And this aligns very, very well with, with some of those priorities and recognising the work that we're doing around violence and vulnerability um, and some of those other key pieces of work. Um, one of the things that the police are actively involved in now is designing out. And so when we look at planning applications for redevelopment, we're designing out some of the things that are causing some of the, the antisocial behaviour. So to give an example of that is poor lighting, underground tunnelling, all of those sort of dark areas where I, I term it, and my team always laugh at me, dark deeds take place in dark corners. So what we need to be doing is designing those out. And again, that, that's coming from the police and that there is a police dedicated team working on supporting planning applications for that very purpose. So again, I think this aligns very, very well um, and, and means that it's not new, it's not different, it's just aligning and, and, and making sure that we're being consistent in our approaches going forward. Thank you, Julie. Uh, Mark Tebbs. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'd just like to also kind of fully support the, the work and the, uh, and the comments that have just been made. Uh, I think it's really important we have a document which is kind of aspirational, is, is really focused on how we're going to kind of tackle the big questions, how we're going to improve the outcomes uh, uh, for our kind of population uh, and really focus on those wider determinants of health. Uh, through the the strategy group what i'm really excited about is how we're also making the links to delivery how, how we're going to make some of that happen how we're linking it up to the kind of brighter futures work and the adult integrated care strategies so it feels like we have um on a, a starting to build both that kind of aspirational kind of visionary document around how we want kind of thorough to look and how we're going to make an impact on outcomes but also working through some of that detail around how we make that happen. So um, just really support the work and, and the kind of collaborative work that we are um, uh, using to kind of make that happen. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Sheila Murphy. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'd just like to support everything everyone else is saying that, you know, fully support doing this refresh and, uh, you know, we'll be involved in that. I think what I'd like to say, obviously, is around children's is that we... If we get it right for children, then going into adulthood, hopefully we get it even better. But and we've obviously got the strategy coming up next around children's. I think it's really important that we do cross-reference with all the other strategies we've got in place. Because um, I'm thinking we've just updated our youth crime governance um, strategy as well, as well as Brighter Futures. So there's a lot in there that, that has a focus on on how we can improve things for our residents and what we're going to be doing. So I, I don't know if we've got a mapping process and maybe in doing this, if we can map all these other strategies we've got in place just to cross-link them. So it's almost like having this overarching document that says, 
um, this priority, you'll also find it as a priority in this plan or this refresh so that it's in one place and we can, we can see it. So it makes it live rather than a document that just goes on a shelf somewhere but keeps it, keeps it real for us all. Thank you very much, Sheila. Uh, Pretty. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I am involved in one of the groups, so I'll just say that now as a disclaimer now. So I've made some of these points with Joe as well. I think um, three things from me. So one is the using the engagement or the opportunities to engage that we're already are already taking place. I think that's really key because I don't think for as Sheila said, you know, we have like five, seven strategies for each strategy. If we go out and engage the community for it, it's all the same thing. So I think it's about using the narrative, the um, inputs that our communities have made rather than trying and doing the same thing again and again. And um, we are seeing that, you know, when we're talking about cancer screening, how many cancer screening conversations are we having with people about different parts of the body? Um, the second thing is about the so what piece, um, as um, Councillor Hullen was saying, in terms of so what, so what, what does that 22 years age gap mean? And I think it's about helping different partners in the system make sense of it. So what does it mean to a consultant in a hospital? Because, you know, w with the best will in the world, health inequalities or wider determinants sit somewhere else. So how do we bring it into practice in terms of, so what can I do, you know, when we have uh, people in that uh, suffer, you know, low quality of life for those 22 years, how can I improve their quality of life while they're going through it? And I know housing and environment is happening in other places. So the so what fee piece for different um, partners. And I think the third thing is about trying to, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking as mid a hospital which sits across mid and south Essex, it's about ensuring that this awareness is at, raised at every level. So for me, Tharak health, Tharak's health and wellbeing strategy around leveling up. Um, I was at a South End conversation earlier this week and it is about health inequalities and wider determinants of health, um, health as well. So I don't think it's going away, it's just raising awareness, especially for colleagues who may not usually be around the table or may not think or engage with this um, piece of work. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Pritchie. I think they're very uh, excellent points well made. I, I think so. your last comment about colleagues who might not necessarily be around the table to engage, I think that's something we're going to come on to just as we get to the end of the item, just to make sure we do get the, the full level of engagement we do want. Um, any final comments on uh, Joe's report? Councillor Hewlin? Yeah, sorry. Um, uh, Sheila made two very valid points. One I'd already written down, actually, young children are our future adults, so we've got to get it right. That's why it's so important with the mental health thing to get the right procurement. The collating of the strategies, that was like music to my ears. We do, we need to be able to, in a digital age, we need to be able to in, interlink and click through. Can we add an appendices of acronyms, please, for all us newbies? Um, I don't think it's just the newbies who need that. Yeah. The, the collaborative working, you're just highlighting how important that is right across everything. We did have a, an outside conversation about making sure that we put the health and well-being strategy and thought into the implications section. All our reports that come forward, we look at finance, we look at diversity and equality. We definitely need to be looking at health and well-being in order to give it importance right across all reports and all areas of the council. Thanks, Councillor Hewlin. I'm not seeing. Can I just respond? Uh, to the oh, Ian, please. Um, so. Thank you, colleagues, for your comments, and we'll take those back into the, the strategy group. I think there's some really, really helpful suggestions. I particularly like what you've said, Sheila, and what you just um, uh, 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 highlighted as, as well, Councillor Healy, in terms of um, a thread through. So the, I think our, our intention, absolutely, is to have this as a high-level document, and then there'll be a series of how, how and what and how that sits underneath it. But... I think in this strategy, we can can really highlight those. Um, uh, similarly, and uh, kind of Joe, you you kind of I think say it in your presentation, but uh, I think your your suggestion in terms of the implications, uh, what we need to do with the strategy is actually get this to coordinate the entire work of this organisation and the organisations of our.
partners to, to deliver this single um, incredibly important um, aim that, 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 we, that we all agree on in terms of, of levelling the playing field. And so one quite neat way of doing that would be for every council paper in terms of the implications to have considered the impact on, on that aim. Yeah. So I, I think that, that's an absolutely great suggestion. Uh, Pretty, what you said about consulting, we consult the same people again and again on different services. So I, I think we really, really recognise that. I brought um, a presentation to our Integrated Care Partnership, our alliance, uh, uh, yesterday afternoon on that very topic. Um, that we need to stop. I don't think we consult well. We consult on services, it's often, or strategies, it's often um, consultative rather than driving. Um, and people don't live their lives like that. They live their lives in terms of localities and places, not through our services. Um, so we do have uh, plans in terms of a much more integrated and continuous um, um, process of engagement at locality level. The new PCNs, I think, are a really um, exciting footprint on which to build a lot, a lot of this work, including integrated engagement. But a, a point very well made. If I may Please. just to add to that, I think the, the, the issue is also then how do we help everyone access what we've done? Because if we are, if, I don't know, I do, and to be fair, we shouldn't care who engages, but if we have a process, if the PCNs are the closest and that's where the engagement is happening, how do we, one, raise awareness with everyone else in the system saying this is happening, and two, help them spread the message or share what has been kind of, you know, said in that community engagement. I think that will also be key. So thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, colleagues, for a very um, vigorous and informative debate. Um, I think I've pulled together all the suggestions and recommendations, which I'll just go through. Um, but the one, the one extra point I would, I don't know if it would constitute a seventh area, Joe, or whether it, whether it would fit into one of the other six. I think we need to reflect upon the position that people like Mac hold or wider partners. You know, as much as I would like to believe that Thurrock is you know, a totally sovereign state and we run everything from border to border, you know, the reality is there are lots of health determinants that are visited upon us. You know, we, we do not have an acute hospital in our locality, but Basildon is one of the most important partners that we have. Um, we do not have a significant um, university within the borough, but that is a major landscape for our young people. Uh, we do not have, I don't believe, any major uh, duly bail hostel facilities in the borough, but that's a major health determinant. So I think we, I think there's just a, an element that we need to mix into it just to reflect the fact that a lot of this stuff is going to be determined by how we lobby and how we engage with partners, how we strengthen partnership working, and how we actually understand the right partners that we need around the table. Um, so... Going through comments that are made, so I think what Bald is saying is we would like to find a way to add health and wellbeing impacts to recommendations of council reports. So I think, Darren, that's a request that we need to send to democratic services for them to work out what the process is to change the report template. I think we're saying, Joe, that we want to aim for perhaps March rather than January for a formal sign-off of the strategy. It would be good, Darren, um, and I know myself and Councillor Hewlin have discussed this offline, if we could, for each of the individual six sections, uh, invite the entirety of board to meet on teams informally with the AD group so we can give the strategy actual time to be debated and then refer it back to board for actual sign-off. Um, and then the questions that the points that we've made regarding um, actually asking the questions why have we got areas of uneven unlevel playing fields in the borough if we could take those draft questions Darren if we could email them to the whole membership of the board say these are the questions we are posing to ourselves do you think any other questions need to be posing do you think any of these questions need to be sharpening perhaps if we give a calendar week for people to reply is that reasonable Brilliant. Well, Joe, thank you very much. and thank you all partners for uh, a fun debate. Right, we'll move on to item eight, Bright Future Strategy. Sheila Murphy. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just sort of listening to the um, Brighter Futures Restrat 
re refresh. You know, we're sorry, the, bright, the health and well-being refresh, the brighter futures strategy refresh is, is probably at the end of that process. So we have spent over a year thinking and consulting and working with our partners, um, working across the piece, consulting with children, looking at our data, looking at the needs to have reached this point that we've reached now. So I, I fully understand, Joe, when you're saying it's too quick to do it in sort of four to five months. You know, we've taken a bit longer to do this um, strategy here for Bright Futures. So what you've got in front of you is a paper that provides an update on our progress um, in completing that. It's still in draft currently, um, and it's being amended for accuracy as well. And obviously, any comments that we get from today, um, we're out um, for public consultation at the moment, um, which started in June. We want and aiming for our strategy to be published by September um, 2021. And our strategy will obviously feed into the health and wellbeing strategy as well. Um, so the partnership, the Children's uh, Brighter Future Partnership, we've agreed four strategic priorities. And we decided that the issue of transitions for children would cut across all of the priorities. We, we, we had a long debate about having a separate priority for transitions, but actually we felt it's something that is in every single piece of work that we do in children's services, whether it's transitioning between services while you're still children, but then transitioned at the point that they're becoming adolescents, young adults, and moving on into adult services, which we think is a really big priority for us as a partnership for the health and well-being board and all the other partnerships that we have because it's it's such a significant area for children young people and for adult services because we need to get that bit right um, so the four priorities that we have in the um, document is um, one is for all children are enabled to achieve their potential focusing on education and skills in particular um, each of the strategy areas has a lead from the partnership. We're not expecting that person to deliver everything on that, but they're the lead, so they do the coordinating. So for that particular priority, it's the Assistant Director for Education and Skills. That's Michelle Lucas, and I think she's still on, I can see her, she's still on the call here. Um, our second priority is um, that children are able to access the services they need to stay healthy um, we've got to focus on prevention and early intervention, um, also on maternity, and that we're breaking that down into 0 to 5 and 5 to 19. Um, so the Assistant Director for Public Health is our lead on that priority. Our third priority is all children can live safely in their communities, um, we, and then that is a focus on preventing serious youth violence and gang membership. And the assistant director leading on that is um, for children's social care. And our fourth priority um, is children and their families experiencing good emotional health and well-being. Um, we're focusing on strengthening protective factors, reducing risk factors on children and young people's mental health and commissioning of services that support and treat young people in their families with uh, mental ill health. And that's the director for young people, children, young people, mid and south Essex. I think Helen's on this call as well. Um, so we have comprehensively looked at our needs and the priorities. I'm not going to go through the whole report because I know you've had that report. I think it's a really good report um, at, at, and, and strategy. And at the moment, as I say, I feel we've worked through a very long process to get to this point. So I think it is very comprehensive. Um, but we do want to hear if there's any other views or things in there that, that people either think was good and you want more of, or actually we need to bolster anything else in the um, strategy. Um, and before I sort of close on that bit, I would especially like to thank... Um, the Assistant Director in Public Health Children, Theresa Slami Ore, who has led on pulling this together for us and has really driven it. You know, so although everybody's been involved, you know, it's taken one person to make sure that it's held, that we're followed up, and that we've got to a product that's actually going to make a difference for our children and young people. Thank you very much, Sheila, for your presentation. Uh, questions or comments? Uh, I'll, 
I'll happily kick off. Um, I understand your point that transition needs to be embedded in everything, but in my mind, when we see things go wrong, it is frequently a issue of transition from service. I mean, Mac and Alex started off um, our board meeting this morning talking about um, the wider work and the greater collaboration we need um, in partnership with EPUT to make sure that transition is right, to make sure that EPUT don't end up with a, a load of cases where children's mental health issues have been able to escalate out of control to the point we're just making dozens of referrals for tier four beds. So I'm not quite sure I understand why transitions wouldn't be its, it, its, its own priority. Because it, it just seems to me that when we have big system mistakes, it does tend to be um, children transitioning you know, from what is really quite a complicated system into another pretty complicated system. So we did have quite a lot of debate on this in the partnership and in the feedback we got. Um, and I think the view came down to, we could have a separate transitions priority, but actually all the other priorities has issues about transitions within it. So we need to make sure that it isn't seen as a silo issue, that there's a, a, a report over here that talks about transitions, but the stuff that we've done on the other priorities isn't about transitions. Um, so I think we fell down on the side of saying that each of our priorities would have something in there about transitions. It was a very finely balanced conversation, and I think, you know, unless colleagues who are also listening want to add to that, but we came down on the side of if we had just one priority about transitions, it might take away from the fact that transitions cuts because it's not just transitions into adult services, it's also for children moving through the children's system where they have transitions. So that's where we came down on it. There's very strong views, you know, obviously we can, but it would mean having to redraft quite a bit of this if we now had a separate transitions um, document um, priority. I don't know if Helen or Michelle want to add anything to that. Uh, Helen's hands up first. Thank you, Chair. Um, just, to, just to add to Sheila, there was um, quite a debate around it, and you're absolutely right. Transitions is, is a really key area or touch point um, phase for children and young people, whether that's moving from preschool to school, whether it's moving from primary, primary school to secondary school, or whether it's moving from uh, preparing for adulthood, um, sort of moving from children's services to um, um, adult services. Um, or out into the, or, or moving out of a service, um, out of a secondary care service, back into the community and into um, community care. So, um, trans so transitions is an absolute theme that was well well discussed in detail in each of the um, key priority areas, and we'll have actions around it. Um, and I think. For me, um, it certainly was in, you know, a key theme that we need to drive forward and have clear actions around. But if it's sat alone, um, as Sheila was describing, it, it would be um, not integrated with all of that work priority area. And we, and we saw it as being an important part to be considered along with all the other transformation and, and quality improvement areas. Um, that's, that's my, just to add to Sheila's thoughts. Michelle? I mean, I echo that. I mean, it, it's really interesting. It was lots and lots of debate about this one, actually. We had lots and lots of conversations. I think what we're clear as uh, the leads for the different um, sort of strategic priorities is that actually trans transitions runs throughout that. So I'm very clear in the area that, and as Sheila quite rightly said, whilst I've got the lead, I won't be doing it all, but clearly I need to ensure that transitions runs throughout that. So I think it was something uh, that a lot of time was taken to consider. And I think as Helen and Sheila have said, we, we didn't want it standing alone. We wanted it absolutely embedded in all that we're doing um, across our strategic priorities. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Helen. Uh, Councillor Hewlin. Yeah, I, I can, James, I can see the logic behind that completely working. Providing transitions is a key priority within each directorate's block, because you've got four squares, say, because uh, statistically, when you're working on problem solving, if you tackle 20% of the problem, you can get 80% of the result of solving the problem. So if you're each tackling it, 
you're probably tackling it much better as a whole and you will see a better improvement, I think, in the, the route that's being taken. No, I think that's a very valid point. Uh, any other? Joe Broadbent? Thanks. I just wanted to say I think this is um, a really comprehensive strategy and I think the it, it shows the multidisciplinary input that there's been and this kind of the the what, the how and the implications is really clear flowing through the, the four strategic priorities and I think the trick for the health and wellbeing strategy will be to take that and thread it as that kind of life course through our domains. So, so we'll definitely... Um, definitely do that and the other thing I just wanted to note was I, I was really impressed with the engagement approach that you took with young people for this has been a really innovative I think and meaningful engagement with with young people around this uh, and if board members haven't looked at the I think is it on you on YouTube it's really worth looking at it's excellent yeah it's really good engagement thank you Joe any other questions or comments pretty um Thank you. I think this is pretty comprehensive. I think one comment I wanted to make was children spend most of their life in school. So school has a really central role, and I can see that coming out throughout the theme. And some work, as Joe knows, um, we are doing through the hospital with kind of you know careers in school and all of that. But over the last 18 months, and it will continue, it will be two years before children, you know, the school system is settled. There has been a lot of disruption in schools. So, and I think rightly or wrongly, to some extent, we are assuming, yes, but children will get on. How, how can we ensure that we put a little bit more effort into ensuring that children catch up? Because personally, I've seen kids in my family. I, mean, I, I really feel for them. You know, I'm not sure whether they've, they've had the opportunity to caught up. They've just moved from one place to the other, and they're there. And then I know we're putting a lot of support effort, but I think there needs to be something which is a bit more comprehensive to say, let's help our kids catch up both in education, in mental health, physically, because there's only so much they were or could have been able to do at home. So kind of a targeted approach to get let children catch up. Does that make sense? Thanks, Pretty. Um, anyone else? Sheila, did you want to sum up or? Um, yeah, really pleased to have this strategy here at Health and Wellbeing Board. You know, want children to be front and centre of the work that's going on. You know, I, I, I think this is a, a, a really good strategy. It's not one that we're just going to sit back and say it's done, it's on the shelf. So we will be constantly um, looking again at all our priorities and reporting back on them and updating accept the point that you've said because obviously things keep changing at the moment you know so when we started out on this we weren't in the middle of a pandemic you know um, things are still moving on as we speak so so we will keep coming back to looking at this and making sure that it links in really well with all those other sort of sort of point I made a bit earlier about you know there's so many other strategies at the moment you know we've got to be smart about how we deliver on them so that we do deliver and we make a difference. And, and I think this strategy does do that. Great. Thank you very much, Sheila. So we're asked to uh, approve the reporting principle and delegate the Brighter Futures partnership to uh, sign the strategy off. I'm sure the strategy should also go to Cabinet, shouldn't it? Pretty sure the last one did. So I'm not aware of that. I'll find out about that, James. Okay. Everyone content with the recommendation? Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Mark, are you leading on the primary care strategy refresh? Brilliant. Thank you, Chair. Um, so your uh, packs contain the um, refreshed primary care strategy. Uh, it's very much building on the previous strategy, so not replacing that work, but kind of building on that, um, and particularly focused on the uh, implications of COVID and the new kind of policy context that we kind of find ourselves uh, within. Um, so the, the, the strategy is very kind of comprehensive. There's lots of detail in, 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 the, uh, in the paper and in the document. Um, what I'll draw uh, members' attention to is uh, page 240, which is the commitments within the strategy, because I think that kind of gives a good 
summary of what uh, the ambition is behind the document. So there are kind of six broad commitments that the strategy makes. So th the first is to support primary care networks uh, around population health management and the kind of data and analytics to be able to fulfill their role as uh, leading that locality primary care improvement work. So uh, there's now uh, clearly a big focus on population health management and Tilbury and Chadwell are um, the, the kind of thorough PCN who are part of the kind of wave three population health management work that has that's just begun and, and, and ably supported by uh, thorough colleagues. The, the second commitment is around kind of digital. Um, clearly there is now um, a, a much bigger emphasis around kind of digital solutions. Um, there is a separate uh, primary care digital strategy. Um, th this strategy supports that work around rolling out of apps and online consultation platforms um, and um, uh, resources that help kind of self-management, for example, the work on blood pressure at home. The, the third kind of commitment is, is around kind of workforce. So clearly we need to build capacity within primary care. Um, there is through the, a, the additional roles reimbursement scheme um, um, work happening on and at each of the PCNs to expand the roles within primary care and to make sure through the workforce training hub that we have the right support to help them do that recruitment in a, in a kind of uh, a seamless and efficient way, but also that the workforce have the right skills to be able to kind of deliver the new models of care. Um, we're also working um, at the kind of system level around how we uh, operate the system, operating budgets, so all of the work that's happening around the stewardship program to really understand the kind of service line costs and how we shift left towards uh, a much greater emphasis on kind of prevention and early intervention. So using the kind of clinical leadership to understand um, uh, how resources flow within a pathway and how we can uh, optimize that pathway and uh, intervene as early as possible. The, the fifth commitment is, you know, we are, as we kind of started the conversations today, in a kind of period of quite significant organizational change with the formation of the integrated care system. So ensuring that primary care voice at kind of PCN, at place, and at system is, is, is very strong, that local clinical uh, knowledge around um, the kind of needs of our communities and how we respond to those needs um, needs to um, be at the forefront as we um, move away from being a kind of CCG into an integrated care system. Um, and then the, the last uh, commitment is around um, the work on kind of co-designing the kind of integrated care models uh, place. And um, I'm pleased to say that kind of PCNs have been absolutely uh, integral to our work through the Alliance and through the recent Better Care Together conference. They, they held uh, a number of kind of sessions and are absolutely committed to the development of uh, kind of local communities of practice so they can really um, uh, understand the assets locally and are able to uh, build the relationships with uh, local um, um, clinicians and providers and stakeholders and communities indeed uh, to help uh, serve those as best they can. So um, there's lots of detail, Chair, in the, uh, in, in the paper. I'm happy to take um, comments or questions on, on, any, on any aspects of it, um, um, but they're the kind of six key commitments that ride through the document. Thank you very much, Mark. Are there any questions or comments? Uh, Alex? Thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you, Mark. And, um, and great to see fully supportive um, of the refresh. I think um, the game changer here is the really robust use of population health data, I think, to identify the priorities for the PCN to work on, but also as, as an almost integrator so that everybody wraps around that common aim. And I, I, I've been involved in 
um, primary care collaboration from a community services perspective for many years, but it does feel as if it can be different. And I think we're seeing that in Thurrock already. Thank you, Alex. Thanks. Mac? Thank you, Chair. And um, the, the refresh of our primary care strategy is, of course, intended to be um, something supportive to all the work that's going on in Thurrock. Um, it's definitely a not only, but also. Um, uh, happily, Thurrock has great leadership in place um, through people like Dr. Anil um, Kalil and um, your, your PCNs uh, with people like uh, Dr. Manjeet Sharma uh, are doing excellent work. And Mark and Rahul and colleagues in the CCG are working closely with them on all of the local aspects. Um, there are some local challenges too as well. I'm conscious that as well as all of the successes uh, around primary care generally, individual practices or indeed in one instance uh, partnerships can throw up some awkwardnesses that begin to um, uh, you know, impinge on, on, on service delivery. So uh, where you get partners disagreeing about things, it can ultimately affect patient care. And we all need to keep an eye on, on those things. And I know Mark and colleagues are. But the thing that strikes me most is something from um, your next paper, actually, that um, emphasizes that um, primary care networks need to operate at neighborhood level and are concerned with uh, delivery and to working differently with communities. Primary care networks um, are the future, and we need to see that materially different way of working closely at place, at neighbourhood, and in communities, so that we don't think just GP, uh, we think the full range of professionals that work around primary care, um, not just nurses and pharmacists, but everybody involved in primary care, including the patient participation groups. And that um, we see that that different way of uh, working, uh, being focused on the whole population that a PCN serves. They're not GP clubs. They are there to uh, develop service for communities. That's the way that uh, Dr. Sharma and others are approaching it, but it's a big change within the NHS and it can sometimes get lost in all our verbiage. So uh, I hope our refresh strategy complements and will support the work that's being done locally in Thurrock, but that local work, that local focus on specifics is what's really important and our role is to support and extend and complement what's already happening on the ground. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Mac. Any other comments? Councillor Hewlin? Yeah, I think following on from what the gentleman says, what we had a conversation within the members, and I, I think it was uh, quite verbalised to you, the situation that is felt overall with uh, GPs. I'm a bit concerned for integration when one of the things you highlighted was that you're still struggling to get GPs across the borough to have an integrated appointment system and calling system. And if we're struggling with fundamentals like that, I, I just wonder how you visualise overcoming that, because that's going to have to over, be overcome pretty quickly to move forward with integrated centres. If we can't integrate with each other, working partners, uh, uh, Thank you, Councillor Hewlin. Mark? Thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you for that comment. Yeah, we're, we're not pretending everything's rosy. Um, we've recently had uh, the GP survey, which um, showed that kind of satisfaction with primary care services locally is not where we want it to be, so we're absolutely not hiding from that, from that reality. Um, I, I think on your kind of specific um, point, um, we have uh, invested with the PCNs uh, for some project manager support um, because one of the aspirations of two of their um, uh, kind of PCNs is to do that work around having a much more integrated kind of telephone and access system. 
So at the moment they are individual and independent practitioners. Um, so it's quite a, uh, I think it's quite a bold step for a number of practices to come together and want to do something kind of quite radically different. So uh, we are absolutely supportive of that and have invested in some project management support to, to help them um, you know, materialize that, uh, that ambition. Um, uh, some of the other stuff that they're, they're starting to work together on is, is for example, a, a new obesity pathway. So, again, sort of like moving away from just working as kind of individual practices, but actually having a, a collective locality offer. So, it, it, it's quite early days for the PCNs, and I think probably, at the, you know, for the last 18 months, the PCNs have been really focused on the vaccination program and dealing with COVID and, and you know, uh, 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 and and all of the rest of that, as you'd imagine. Um, I think they're now starting to look at, you know, what is the, what's the purpose of the, the kind of uh, the PCN, how their governance works, how they improve that kind of joint working and, and absolutely, um, you know, we're really focused on what the kind of CCG and place resources can do to kind of come around them and provide them with the, you know, the, the workforce support and the analytical support to make that happen. Thanks, Mark. Just to continue that conversation, obviously I was going to ask a question about the, um, you know, the frankly not particularly good outcome that we had from the GP satisfaction survey. And one thing that I noticed about the primary care strategy is that it's very much about forward direction in terms of developing the PCNs. And there's not a huge amount in there about a rear view look in terms of where we have got conflict. A couple, some of the issues that Matt alluded to where we've got conflict, where we've got low satisfaction, where we've got poor performance, what are we doing to bust that? This is, so much of this strategy feels like it's looking forward to where we want to go, rather than at times delving into the position that we don't want to be in at the moment. And you know, I would say that you know, during the period where uh, Thurrock, Thurrock Public Health Team and the CCG were working in concert and we had things like our uh, GP balance scorecard, you know, we, we were working robustly, hand in glove, and you know, putting a great deal of pressure on primary care, pointing out poor service examples, um, incentivising them with you know, stretch cloth payments. And you know, in four years, we did go from, I, Ian might correct me, but we went from two, two GP practices rated good to over 20 in the space of four years. So we, we've seen that you know, we're incredibly robust and sometimes difficult conversations can really yield results. And if there's one thing I would say is about this strategy, I think it's a very good strategy, but I think it's lacking the difficult conversations and it's more about a, a forward direction roadmap. <laughs> Do you want to answer that while my director deals with his hiccups? <laughs> Thank you, yeah. So the, I think the strategy is forward looking. Um, our, our place plan, uh, gives them a much more um, kind of operational focus on what we're doing now. So, so there is um, work happening uh, around the kind of uh, quality monitoring of practices, the visits, how we're providing uh, data through, um, you know, the Eclipse system, um, uh, all of the work um, around getting practices where we need to be in terms of CQC. So. I think that's covered much more in our place plans, our local place plans, than it is with that with this MSC strategy. But just to absolutely assure you that that work is absolutely happening at the same time. So I beg your pardon, Mac. I did miss your hand. Uh, not, not at all, Chair. Um, uh, just to echo your comments, really. Um, uh, and uh, I wasn't meaning to sound um, glum for Councillor Hewlin. Um, uh, there has been great work done. Uh, on primary care by Ian and Mark and others uh, over recent years, and we've seen the improvements. I, I was trying to highlight the point that you made, um, uh, Chair, which is not everything in the garden in um, uh, GP practices is, is rosy yet. We've done really well, but there are still issues that we need to address. I think the, uh, the, the, the there is a, a phased progression that we need to see now. PCNs are the green shoots of the new things that uh, Ian has helped 
uh, primary care understand around population health management and so on, that more broadly based and forward looking approach. And the PCNs are beginning to uh, drive forward in Thurrock on those things. I guess the real nub of my message, uh, Chair, is that I need your alliance in Thurrock to take that proactive approach that you described towards primary care generally and uh, expanding its focus uh, to pick up the issues of customer satisfaction and service integration that you've highlighted. And my focus will be to um, support the Alliance, to encourage the Alliance, and indeed to um, hold the Alliance to account for taking us beyond those things that the CCGs have been able to tackle in the past. Um, I guess the um, primary care has um, roots that, are, that go beyond 70 years. Um, so I guess falling out in practices and between partners is um, a, a historic trait from that time. Um, we've seen in Thurrock that that more progressive approach um, towards population health management that Ian and others have encouraged and that um, raising of standards that you and others have achieved, Chair, has, has made a difference. Um, I guess the um, integrated care system and our refresh strategy heralds where we need to go next. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Max. Very helpful. Ian? I was going to make a not similar uh, point to Mark and Max. So this is an MSC strategy. This is relatively high level. Um, I actually think it's right that it's relatively high level because um, the alliances are developing their own identity. The PCNs will have different priorities. So I'm pleased we don't have a really directive one size fits all across the whole of MSC because I think that would be entirely wrong because I think um, there are undoubtedly different issues and different nuances we'd want in different PCNs. Um, I, I, I'd say a few more things. I think the PCNs, uh, as I alluded to earlier, I think are an incredibly exciting opportunity. We've done, as Max says, a um, enormous amount in terms of population health management and um, particularly long-term conditions, diagnosis and management in primary care. And uh, yeah, things like our cardiovascular indicators have gone from pretty much all red to all significantly better than, than England in the space of a about three years and we've quantified that that is having an impact on demand. What we've done to date has been to do that at practice level and it's always struck me as quite mad that each practice tries to manage each quaff indicator in isolation and I think there's an opportunity A to bring some of that capacity and some of that delivery together on a bigger locality footprint uh, um, and secondly in terms of the, the monitoring uh, and management um, of that uh, and some of the informatics sits behind it uh, as this strategy uh, again alludes to I think that there, there's a huge um, uh, opportunity there um, we have a operational capacity issue at the moment without a doubt um, Rahul gave quite a good presentation or very good presentation to the Alliance I think the meeting before um, uh, last um, which really demonstrated I think it was a 30 percent increase in demand for appointments uh, over the last three months and I think unfortunately we are seeing some of the impacts of lockdown where the NHS has quite understandably been been focused for the last 14 months on COVID-19 and um, that's meant that other elements particularly around long-term conditions management um, have had to be scaled back and as a result what we're seeing is a lot of very very unwell patients who maybe haven't had things picked up in the way that they would have been um, in previous years um, so, uh, in I, I do think, though, that, that, that in terms of capacity, we f need to find a, a way as a system to try and what, what we deem cost shift left. So, so, and this is this isn't difficult. This isn't easy to do, but we we know that what happens in primary care, uh, and, and we've quantified that, has a direct impact at what then turns up at the hospital door, and then ultimately what turns up as my door uh, uh, as the DAS. And um, we don't, uh, at the moment, we have historically, um, uh, I think, seen the system in its constituent elements. We have a strategy for primary care and a strategy for community care and a strategy for hospitals. And actually, where we've got to get to is a system strategy, a whole system strategy. We need to see primary care 
as an absolutely critical element in a wider system. Uh, and I think in terms of the new ICS, there is a amazing opportunity with the system budget to start to find ways um, to do that. I think the final point I'd make is we know still we have an inverse care problem going on in Thurrock. The populations at practice level with the greatest health need get the poorest ratio of patients and clinicians. Um, and I think the way we've um, allocated money to practices historically on a, a, a largely per capita basis is, is not fit for where we are now. We have to find a more nuanced way um, so that we're not commissioning for health inequalities. Um, the TICP adult strategy will be looking at all of these things. Um, so I think this is the high level overarching thing. What we need to do now and what we are in the process of doing at Thurrock Alliance level is developing that system strategy um, that will um, specify the, the next phase of primary care. Right. Thank you, Ian. Uh, Alex? I'll be really brief, Chair, but I just wanted to pick up on something that Ian alluded to, which is uh, I think we often describe as, as the missing middle. Um, I certainly, uh, as I know our board are in EPUT, uh, are committed to uh, reaching outwards of our uh, secondary care thresholds to really realise some of that left shift that we talked about. And I think it requires all of us to work differently. This isn't just about primary care. To, to make it happen, it's going to require change in all of our practices. Brilliant. Thank, thank you. you very much, Alex. Um, well, thank you, everyone, for your contributions. I think we've had a, a good discussion. Um, yeah, I, I accept that this is, I, I think this is a good system-wide strategy and obviously pitched at the, the, the whole of Mid and South Essex. However, I am, uh, with Councillor Hewlin, I am strongly of the opinion that that the issues that we are facing that came out of the GP satisfaction survey, these are issues that we need to pile on top of because it's, it's, it is frankly not good enough what some of our constituents are seeing at the moment and we can't allow a desire to plunge forward with developing PCNs to treat GP practices like they are, they are a homogenous group. You know, we wouldn't allow Ofsted to treat all 51 thorough schools the same we need to take the same nuanced approach that if we've got weak primary care it needs to be called out and tackled so perhaps then we could ask for the work that Ian's alluded to that the, the work that we did on the original GP scorecard can there be a conversation between the council and the alliance in preparation for perhaps our September board meeting and bring forward something that we can dis discuss and debate properly not talking about the entire primary care strategy for the borough, but specifically talking about what, what are we going to do in response to the survey? What are we going to do in response to some of these poor standards? Because I just I think we all acknowledge we're not where we need to be right now. And I think it's a strategic issue that Bull should, should take a clear line on. Is everyone content with that as a position? Right, Darren, can we program that in, please? Right, thank you very much. Um, and uh, Mark, thank you for presenting that item. Now, we've got the learning from COVID. A number of colleagues have told me they need to be away at half 12. Mark, what did you want to do? Because I don't want to rush you, but at the same time, w would you rather defer this to our next meeting or? I think, it's a, I, think it's a really, I think it's a really important report and I think it'd be good for us to spend some time on it. Um, I think we could, if, so if we could defer it, I think that would be good. Okay. Right, so if we if we make that item one for our, our next meeting, Darren. Um, health and wellbeing board terms of reference, we, I, we do have to take this report now. Uh, so I think we're just amending the we're, we're just amending the terms of reference, aren't we, to uh, allow Mac a voting seat to reflect that Rahul will have a voting seat. Is that right, Darren? Uh, yes, Council, and uh, no organisational changes have been made. It's just the personnel that are representing the organisations. That's, that's the primary changes in the terms of reference at this stage, Council Orden. So is everyone content with the names of the, the membership list just being updated as per? Great. Great. Thank you very much. Um, that brings us to the end. I think there's a, there's a conversation to be had about the August work plan. 
because uh, a few items are, are falling. So I think we'll take that conversation offline and see what state the reports are in. Uh, with that, I close the meeting at 12.25. Everybody, thank you very much for your attendance and contribution. Thank you. Thank you. We've got a round of applause.